Okay, welcome back. So we are continuing on with script nodes. And yesterday we talked about how uh, scripts encapsulate programmatic code. That uh, since we have a mixing of paradigms here, declarative versus procedural, there's a very carefully organized structuring that goes on. And you could also think of this, since we're designing our own nodes, that here's another case of extensibility, where we're figuring out how to put new functionality in the X3D language, not just uh, your own little scene graph, and how you can write stuff that's not in there already to make X3D do what you want. We did cover a uh, generic modeling diagram that uh, is from the X3D spec, and this basically shows a very loose uh, accounting for all of the different functionality that's needed to be provided by a browser, either working internally or working externally, where scripts in the uh, HTML web page, if there is one, could be passing values to and from the HTML as well as to and from the X3D. So you can build web applications like that. Uh, we will cover uh, a simple part of that, how to put scripts in, uh, how to put an X3D in a web page, but in this course we don't cover the intense details of uh, how you might pass events. But still it's good to be aware that the capability exists. We then looked at what is the execution model for uh, each frame. And uh, there's a number of steps when we draw each frame. The primary uh, aspect of interest is that we have a buffer swap. As we draw one, we then draw another. And that frame buffer swap is what allows the performance of our 3D scenes to be very fast. Because you only get displayed a completed picture, the faster we can do that, one completed picture, replacing another completed picture, replacing the next, that's what gives the appearance of smooth motion. Okay, So there's a definite set of steps that occurs and gets repeated over and over and over again as we render. Okay, given those steps that we go through, let's take a, take a deeper look at uh, what's occurring inside the scene graph when these events are, are going. And so, uh, since the frame buffer is only displayed as a final finished product, that means of necessity any event processing we do has to be in between one frame drawing and the next frame drawing. So during that interval, that's part of the computational work that helps us figure out what gets drawn. So uh, to follow those steps, we've, again, we collect all of our input events and we process them one at a time, usually in order. Not necessarily in order, but we process them. Then. Uh, since we can have a daisy chain, Rube Goldberg, animation chain of events, one thing provoking another in our behaviors, we might get multiple output events produced as we go forward. And there's a special name for this. It's called the event cascade. And that event cascade, as it implies, is it's like uh, if you start a, a rock at the top of the hill rolling, it can knock other rocks and more rocks and more rocks and you get this cascade effect until everything reaches the bottom. Okay, now uh, uh, this is how we change our scene graph and get results. Now there's an important problem that we want to avoid and that would be event loops. And if we think about it, Having one event provoke another, provoke another, is a good thing. But if it never stops producing events, 
Well, overall, your system might want that. I mean, you do want a continuous simulation that runs over time. But if within the interval between one frame and the next, we never stop, that means you never get to the next picture. You never get to the next frame. So it's important that event cascades must terminate. Okay, so how do we do that? It's pretty interesting, actually. Uh, and like most things that you might design that we want to be effective, it has to be simple. So there has to be a simple rule here, and that is if a route that's passing a value to a destination gets the same value twice in a given event cascade, oh, we're looping, okay? So route mechanism, and catching it at the route, make sure that we don't repeat ourselves. That's how we uh, break any event cascades that might otherwise loop, okay? So it's blocked by route checks, okay? Now, uh, uh, this can be subtle sometimes. Like, for example, if we're routing uh, two values as part of an event cascade, maybe some wacky logic's going on, but let's say we route a true event to a destination, and some other logic continues in the event cascade, the rippling out of values, and then we route a false event to that same destination, and that would be okay. But if the events continue to ripple before the next redraw, and we get a third event down a route into that same target destination that's true again, the loop breaking rule would say, okay, I'll stop. I've got the same value here. No good. I will no longer honor that. There may be some other events left over on the to-do list, and they'll continue to be processed until everything is gone because we can't get a loop of logic, one thing provoking another, this breaks the possibility of infinite loop. The simplest kind of infinite loop we might uh, uh, conceptualize here would be if we had two nodes feeding each other and reacting, uh, if one node produced an event which in turn produced another event, you know, perhaps we hooked up two Boolean triggers back and forth to each other. You could, you could think of something like that. Uh, well, there we would go. One, one starts the other, the other starts the one, back and forth. Where do we stop? It wouldn't. Okay, so that's why we have this rule. And of course, our whole goal here is to figure out good behaviors, make them work, but then draw the next frame. That's what we really want to do. So that means in our next frame, We'll have a fully updated set of events. The scene graph will now be animated to the position, the values, the colors, what have you, all the things we want. We go, okay, great, draw another frame and throw that up and then repeat the process. So it's not that we don't want long running continuous simulations that do cool things. It's just that we want to be able to stop them at regular frequent intervals so we can draw a snapshot, draw a picture push that frame out of the double buffer up onto the screen and continue the process in the background. Okay, so now we're ready to go into how do I design my node? And you know that in X3D we have uh, uh, nodes and each node has fields. Okay? You can look at every node in the scene graph, every node we've studied in X3D, and they each have fields defined. So here is how we define fields for our script node, for a node we're defining ourselves. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, it's cleverly named field. <laughs> and uh, in the XML encoding, we uh, uh, make that an element, an XML element that lets us define what a field might be. And uh, because those fields are the interfaces, the inputs, the outputs, the state variables 
for uh, a script node. In, in effect, this defines the functionality of that black box. What can come in, what's remembered, what can go back out again. And so, uh, very important. You might wonder, uh, what, what's this about zero? Why could we have uh, zero fields? Actually, there's uh, an interesting feature in there. In a script node, we can have a function called initialize. Okay, so just by the nature of it being there, if we put an initialize function in there, it might do something to the scene graph, like simply print a message out. Okay, we've started as, as a trace statement, perhaps. And that's why you could have a, a script node without any fields. But otherwise, that's, that's a fairly rare occurrence. Almost always we do want fields because we want to route values in and out. All right, so uh, what else about fields? Well, because this is the node interface, because that structure is so important, because everything is strongly typed in X3D, we have to be thorough about our field declarations. And we must make sure that they have a name, they have a type, also an access type, whether it's uh, uh, input, output, input, output, or initialize only. And then finally, if appropriate, an initial value. Sometimes we don't bother with uh, initial value uh, if it's input only or output only, because those are just transient. They're, they're receiving things or they're sending things, so uh, there's no initial value for what might get sent in or what might get sent out. Okay, uh, and then access type We've sort of looked at as we've gone along in, in the book here, but now we really have to pay attention to that. Which way does, uh, does this go? Where you can most noticeably find access type exposed in X3D right now, or at least in X3D edit, it's on the uh, route panel. When we have our to field and our, our, our from node and our from field and then our to node and our to field, uh, the interface in there is only exposing the fields that matter. It won't give you uh, a listing for fields that aren't able to send an event out up on the to side. Okay. So from has to be an output to the destination, has to have an input. Okay, so the route panel uh, is a good way to expose that. Another great way to check that is with tooltips. Uh, the tooltips for each node do list the type as well as the access type for what it is. So um, if in doubt about how to do these things, that's a good checkpoint. Look at other nodes how they work. Often your scripts are doing similar functionality, so uh, you can follow those examples. Okay, so uh, drilling down here, we've got a, a two screen table here of all of the different types that exist in X3D. So a single field Boolean, a multiple field Boolean, and of course multiple field means array. And then we see this similarly uh, single and multiple for each of the other types. For color, for color RGBA, red, green, blue, alpha, uh, for integers, floats, doubles, etc. Uh, you can also see the norm for default values is when it's a single field, a singleton element, excuse me, a singleton value, then uh, we list the most common value, usually a zero or something like that. If it's an array, we don't give it a default value, we say none. The null array, no entries. If we do put things in that array, like it's an MF color array, then we would have to put in triplets of colors. We'd still have to have the proper counting. Okay, uh, what other types do we have? Uh, uh, images and nodes, single or multiple nodes. Ah, oh, that's interesting. We can write scripts that pass nodes in or pass nodes out. 
So we could not only, not only have to tickle fields within a node, but we could pass nodes themselves. For example, you might pass an array of nodes to a transform to set its children. So that's pretty interesting that we have that level of control here. The rest should look pretty familiar. Uh, rotations, strings, times, we use those all the time. We certainly use vector 3F for position, for translation. And we saw with textures that we also use the 2D, uh, two tuple nodes as well. Okay, now there are some naming conventions, and these ought to be pretty familiar because we've looked at a lot of those just as we've gone along. Uh, X3D is pretty consistent about the names that get created for nodes. So we probably want to follow that if we want our scripts to be sensible and make sense. Uh, if you use the same naming, then there's uh, less head scratching involved about what does this mean really. There's also functionality uh, uh, and in fact maybe this is getting too busy but it's not just naming but it's also field functionality conventions with access type. So if it's an input only then that means when we write our script we're going to create a method in there that sees the input only value goes into that method. We'll see this in a second. Okay, And not only can you get that value, but uh, we're a little verbose about it. We'll tack along a timestamp for when it arrives. So if your script wants to process the timestamp value, maybe keep a clock, internal clock going, figure out how much time has passed since the last time it was tickled, you can easily do that. <coughs> okay, how do output only work, uh, fields work? Well, if the access type is output only, then we set it equal to something, left hand side, also known as an assignment statement, and uh, whenever we set that variable equal to some value, then because that variable has been identified as a field variable, that's a cue to X3D to go, oh, I've got a new event. You just set me, I'm an event out, an output only, boom, that event gets pushed back out into the scene graph. Okay. Initialize only is our third type of uh, access type here. And uh, that's used for state variables, variables that we want to keep track of. We can uh, uh, use them on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of equations. Uh, because they've been initialized, we can use them as part of a computation. If we want to remember them from event cycle to event cycle, we can just assign new values to them. But because they're identified as initialized only, there's not going to be any routing that goes to and from them. Okay, finally, our other uh, uh, type of, uh, our other access type definition here is input-output. So that can send or receive. However, the naming's a bit confusing on that <coughs> because you can define a function name for the inputs and a left-hand side variable for the output. So uh, that can be a little tricky in practice when we do that. <coughs> Jeff, we're going to have to pause at this point. So I tried to give you uh, clean gaps in my coughs <laughs> if you're going to go through in the uh, audio and clean that up. So. <coughs> well, I'm in real trouble because that was my last cough drop. So after this, I have to re revert to mints and hope that I last. Oh, you got something? Mm. 
I start talking with a black tongue at that point? Or? <laughs> it's high technology flavor. <laughs> that sounds like something uh, kids would do in fourth grade. Yeah, let's give the teacher some black gum. Yeah. It's like liquid. It's unacquired. Whoa. Yeah, it's really hard. Wow. It'll clear, it'll clear your sinuses out. Like Do you think I should uh, okay. it'll settle my throat down here? Go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. This looks a little grainy on my screen, which now that it's blown up, how did it look to you guys on your screen? The, the next slide, slide 54. I never noticed that before. Maybe it's because of the dots per inch that I have. But it's okay on yours. She looked fine on the printout I did too. I'm not able to zoom in very well on this. Arg. Well, that might work. That's a little better. Okay, so let's look now at the script life cycle with an example script diagram here. And uh, this includes not just how the script would work uh, within a given frame and the event processing, but also how it would work uh, from the beginning to the end of the scene. 
across all the, all the frames that got drawn in between. So we start by loading the scene. We pull down our inline nodes, external files, and also any external prototypes, uh, which we learned about in Chapter 14. Then we uh, uh, execute our initialize function. Okay, and that does any setup computations we might want to do to initialize things. At that point, we could say that the scene loading is complete, and we can begin the scene rendering, meaning we're going to draw the first screen and uh, begin animating it. Okay, so as our scene operates, runs, events get generated, uh, our script may get tickled by a time sensor or some other input, and then if there is a value that, that gets routed to it, that event will uh, trigger the uh, appropriate response. So let's see here. Uh, if we look at our input event, our trigger field is our input event here. And we can uh, see that trigger field has a corresponding function definition in there so that when an input event comes into the scene, it gets passed right here, uh, what we've called value. Let's try that again. Nope. Not quite right. Okay, there we are. Trigger field gets routed in a value uh, from the route, and that's where our uh, functionality then occurs. This is kind of curious. I haven't used the two together. Let's see if we can try again here. So we'll label that as a route incoming right there. Okay, now <coughs> that event passed in value, we can see it's right here. And so we do have a uh, operation with that that uh, takes care of it. So let's maybe highlight value like this, see if that works. And there's value used as part of another function to uh, uh, compute something with it. In this case we simply print it out. Then what else do we have in this field definition? Well, we've got uh, an output event output only event and we've named that acknowledged and so this one is not a string but rather a boolean so here we see acknowledge within that function and we can see that the uh, acknowledged is put on the left hand side of the equation meaning it's an assignment statement and in this case acknowledged variable is assigned the value of true and that active assignment works not only internally to the script, but it also cues the browser, oh, since I was an output event, send that event out. Okay, so we will get at that point an output event that would have to go over another route. And appear that way. Not quite sure what's going on here, but there we go. I snuck up on it and you get the picture output event comes right there. We've also listed in this uh, diagram uh, the existence of yet another function and that's the initialize function. So you could perform setups there. That might be printing a, a statement to confirm debugging that the script actually loaded properly. It might be initializing a counter or some summation value to zero. Could be any number of things. 
depends on your uh, algorithm. We also see that there's another function called uh, shutdown right here. And like uh, the initialize function, it is optional. Uh, unlike shutdown, we almost never use it. Uh, this might be if uh, you were using Java and it set up network connections or a database connection or some kind of external persistent thing that needed housekeeping to clean up afterwards, that would be the place where you put it in the shutdown function. Okay, so where are we? We've loaded the scene, we've initialized the script, we've started event operation, we got input event during the loop, we've got an output event that it generated. So what happens to that output event? Well, it goes to the event list in the browser. And so if there are any routes, such as right here, that take it elsewhere, then that's handled. Now because there is uh, one event can provoke, provoke another, because one thing can lead to another, we continue and we loop here on the uh, event cascade to make sure that uh, uh, everything's done until we continue to process all the events as described in the previous uh, flowchart. Then when we're all done with that event cascade, we're ready to draw. We render the scene output and then we advance the clock how much time did it take, how many milliseconds or microseconds for your processor to do that computation redrawing, and then that sets us up to repeat and uh, repeat the whole process. So we go again and again. The script only gets invoked when it receives an event. It only responds once it's activated. So the script likely will not be part of every frame rendering, but rather only in response to the activities that occur in the scene. When we're done drawing over and over, and the browser says, okay, I've been told to shut down, as part of good housekeeping, it will invoke your shutdown method and let you uh, clean that guy up if it needs it. And then with that, we're all done and we're complete. Okay, so there's the script lifecycle, how it uh, operates during the conduct of a scene. Well, it seemed like a lot of work, a lot of theory, a lot of setup here. Why don't we just write some now? So if we're going to write a script, let's figure out what scripts do we have, script languages do we have. The primary one is called ECMAScript. This is more commonly known as JavaScript, uh, but we call it that because uh, that's the formal name that it's defined by. We use, uh, because there are many variations, uh, dialects, variants of JavaScript, we're using the one called ECMAScript, which was approved by the uh, European Computer Manufacturers Association, ECMA. And uh, does it sort of sound like uh, an unfortunate skin disease? Well, I guess maybe, yeah. But uh, uh, we didn't name it that. Uh, we're using the precise name. And if you look in the uh, notes for this page, you'll see a couple of helpful links, not only to uh, ECMA International, but also to uh, some Wikipedia background and history on the development of the language, the continued evolution of it. And also some links to where you can uh, pull down the ECMAScript specification. So I guess what the heck, let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, I'm going to go to the page. Then we'll go select the notes. If you're using uh, the PDF version of the slides, of course you have the full slides in the first half of that document and then you have the slides plus notes in the second half of the document. So either way you can get to it. I'm going to use the uh, the open office slide here and here you can see the notes for this slide and uh, there's some ECMA links to it here we also have it directly available at web3d.org and uh, 
first I got a lot of windows opening at once here. Jeff, if you want to clobber all those sub windows, be my guest, or clobber this section, I'm going to pick up again as if nothing happened. Okay, so if we download the ECMAScript specification, uh, uh, here it is. And yes, you can see it's a little bit dated, uh, 1999, but that's okay. It's stable. It works. This is the heart of all the dialects out there, too. So you can think of it that we're uh, in the uh, most common denominator JavaScript right here. And that also gives you the, some more of the background history in that document. Okay, so when you use ECMAScript, uh, it follows what we call our X3D Scene Access Interface, which is our common denominator, common design for application programming interfaces that interact with X3D. So we've come up with a general model for SAI. We've also come up with specific language bindings for ECMAScript and for Java. I do uh, tend to say ECMAScript uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's more precise. Also, it's less confusing because uh, there's Java is a separate program language. We're using Java in the script node. So if we were to talk about a Java script versus JavaScript, uh, that, can, that can quickly get confusing. Uh, I think there's probably a special place in hell for people who uh, come up with names like this, but that's, that's another topic. I think that's over in the uh, philosophy department, uh, religious uh, studies maybe. Uh, be that as we'll, we'll stick with ECMAScript and call it that. Uh, and then quickly uh, double back and say if we put it in an external file, we'll nevertheless use the convention for file naming that's outside, that's used in HTML and most other files, and that's .js, obviously JavaScript. So the parlance we'll use, the terminology we'll stick with is ECMAScript and .js files. But it is pretty cool that we can use both uh, internal and external uh, JavaScript files, because there's merits to both. And uh, when you would use one versus the other, it's kind of an authoring preference. Uh, let's keep going, and we'll look at that preference in a minute. In addition to, go ahead, Fred. I just want to double check something you said for, for SAI, you said there's an ECMA binding and also a Java binding? Correct. There are two languages. So if, um, let's see, our current slides, uh, we're on slides 55 and 56 in this chapter. <clears throat> the ECMAScript, JavaScript slide defines the first language. And then the next slide, Java, shows, uh, well, we also have the Java language. Okay, and where ECMAScript is required, Java is not. However, if a, an X3D browser is going to provide Java capabilities for embedding a script in a scene graph, then they must follow the rules. And our SAI does define the standard rules for how you do that. Okay, so it's optional, but if you do it, you have to do it right. Now, uh, we won't get into language wars about whose language is bigger, whose is better, or what's, uh, who's on top. Uh, that doesn't matter. What, what does matter is each language has its own merits and values. And some advantages for Java is that you can read and write to the network or connect to a database or access the really large set of functionality in the, the Java standard class libraries that are provided. <coughs> Your mileage may vary. Your use uh, can be customized. We do a little bit of Java through the script node here. Currently, the uh, best implementation of that out there 
is uh, XJ3D browser, that open source code base. So a lot of our built-in applications use that. Currently we have a little bit of support in X3D edit for that, but not as much as I want, not as tested as far as I want. Uh, we'll keep working on that. Meanwhile, if you must use Java or need to use Java or want to use Java, then I would recommend you go to this resource here, the XJ3D Tutorials. That's your, uh, your best location to learn more and to test more to, to actually use XJ3D. And uh, we'll p keep playing catch up and get there. Okay, so uh, Vive la Difference, it's good we have some choices. We have both ECMAScript and Java for use in the script node. <clears throat> now given those two variations, uh, there are some consistencies that uh, continue. Um, we'll look at these and, and the examples we'll give for the rest of the chapter will be using ECMAScript. So uh, first of all, the URL, the URL field. And uh, that's uh, something we've seen before. We've seen it in the anchor node. We've seen it in image texture different ways to uh, get external files referred to. So this one's pretty interesting because uh, simplest use is list the file name. And uh, that's great. So we can list a single file. But we can also list multiple files. We've seen this before as well in the anchor node in the image texture node where you might list a local copy first and then an online URL for reliability. You can also switch the order around uh, for which one you might preferentially want to take. But it builds the reliability of that link so that we're not single point failure vulnerability like uh, occurs in HTML unfortunately. Okay. Um, it's important though this is not intended as some kind of switch or chooser or variation. They should be pointing to the same resource. You want to have consistent functionality. Uh, if there's any variation, it should only be maybe in uh, timeliness or uh, relevance, but uh, usually we, we want those scripts to be functionally identical. Okay. However, uh, the script node goes one step beyond what's possible in uh, uh, Anchor and in uh, image texture that we saw before, the other nodes. And that is, uh, we can also embed scripting code right in the URL field. Now, why did we do that? Uh, uh, <laughs> good question. If we were just defining it from scratch, from XML, we probably wouldn't do that at all. However, this was the approach that was initially defined in uh, Vermal 97. And so because we want to maintain backwards compatibility, we also have it as the same exact encoding approach in the classic Vermal encoding. And then we gave the option for authors who just must have it or for browsers who strictly implemented it that way, we give you that option. Uh, but there is a preferred way to do it in XML and that's using something called a C data block, which is uh, an, a curious XML construct uh, that lets you, I think I got it right there, uh, that lets you identify text, plain text, in your XML file and it protects it from getting reread, uh, reparsed, remangled, if you will, because it tells the XML parser that this is character data, leave it alone. Don't try to turn less than signs into element definitions or anything like that. So C data block is how we usually do this if we're going to embed ECMAScript right within the scene. Okay, so here's an example of that showing the syntax and uh, <coughs> we have here uh, a sample script node with uh, some definitions and uh, here we've called our field names A, B, C, and D and uh, then we've put a block in internal to that. 
So the C data block would be right here. There's our C data construct, and that is telling our X3D browser, more specifically our XML parser, to leave it alone and don't touch anything in there. So uh, we don't have to worry about it, white space getting thrown out or other things that would uh, really screw up the scene. So there's our block and it's protected. And notice then that uh, in this case, we didn't need a URL definition in this script node. Uh, why? Because the script was embedded. Embedded right there following the field definitions. As for the rest of it, we can see that the field definitions are pretty straightforward, uh, where we define the type. Where we define the access type. Is it an input? Is it an output? Is it initialized? Is it both an input output? And then for the guys that are uh, uh, initializable, we'll also put in uh, an initialization value so that uh, uh, the script can properly start. And so if you have, well, let's draw this in a slightly different way now. If we have uh, an initialize only field, then it is required that you have an initialization value. If you have an input output field, you must have an input uh, uh, initialization value. For the other cases, it's required that you don't have an initialization value because it makes sense. Okay, so what's highlighted right now are the requirements. Anything different than that will be erroneous and would mean your script node was not properly defined. Okay, so we saw a couple of things on this slide, both the C data <coughs> construct and also the uh, 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 node interfaces. So here's some actual text then for a field. Notice this is not embedded within a scene right now, but rather it's listed as a separate file. Okay, and there's a comment to that effect right up at the top that if it were copied into a C data section in a field, then we would want to uncomment it and make sure that ECMAScript statement did appear right at the front. But as long as it's uh, uh, in a separate file here, we don't put that ECMAScript in the header. Okay, now the, the particular file we're looking at here is new ECMAScript.js. This is the the file you will get if uh, you uh, use X3D Edit to create a new script. So let's do that. I'm going to uh, jump out of the slides now to uh, X3D Edit. <coughs> Sorry, Jeff, going to have to pause again. Is this a good point to take a break? Yeah, Since it's a two hour period, why don't we take a few minute break and <coughs> I'll do a few opera warm up exercises in the bathroom.
possessive. Oh, okay. Uh, I can't do that. I didn't get his name, but he, uh, he's right across the hall. <clears throat> Pretty good. Say again, Fred? Uh, a question about the SDN repo for this class. Yep. So, tell me again the status on that. Are, are we going to try to use that same machine, which is, uh, I think it's uh, mmog.drn.mts.edu? Yeah, uh, we're definitely going to use the same site, but we, we had a dialogue yesterday about how we might change it around, so I need to push the ideas around with Don. We might restructure it one more time. What, where did we land yesterday? I think it was landing towards, we'll keep it organized by course. Yes, so, so likely we'll leave the 3204 right where it is, Fred, and just add a 4205 next to it. I don't, I don't think I can get to that um, from, from off campus, if you will, but, but I, I ought to be able to on um, FSH at the Savage uh, MTS EDU, and then from there, uh, hopefully I can access that system. Yes. And I'll so verify. please work with Don on that. Yeah, I'll verify that. Super. Okay, so let's go from the slides to X3D edit. And we've got two ways to get here. We can either select file menu and then new X3D and uh, new ECMAScript sample JS code. Or we can select the button here, the, uh, the JS button on the uh, interface. right here and either way will get you a new script so here it is popping up and uh, we see that comment line that if if you want to use this as a template for dropping into the scene great you can just cut and paste it from here we prompt you with a bunch of to do's on how to customize this thing and I think it's a good practice to uh, put uh, uh, put proper comments in your external JavaScript file just like you would put appropriate metadata in your X3D file. And then we see a template of example code in here for what an initialized method would look like and what a, a field uh, would get defined as. If we had an input only field, it would get uh, its name right there. We get a value, possibly a timestamp. So this is excessively commented to make it uh, hopefully easy for you to produce this. And uh, notice it also gives you my input output field name and prompts that. So maybe simpler is just looking at an existing one. Here's uh, for the first example we're going to do in a couple of slides. Simple script state events. Uh, uh, what's notable here is this code is uh, color coded. We're taking advantage of uh, the NetBeans engine here and its ability to understand uh, JavaScript. So when we put our ECMAScript file in with a .js extension, we get that for free. And it will also do syntax checking on a lot of stuff. So if we put uh, something that's uh, illegal in there, it's going to pick up on that pretty quickly and, and indicate what's wrong, at least from its perspective. Hey, if that's a statement, where is my semicolon? Uh, this one it gives, it just punts and says syntax error and lets that go. So here we are. Let's undo that and uh, we're back to a legal file. Okay. We could also put it inside the script 
And so if we were going to do that, we could go to this scene and find the script node and stick it in there. So here's our script node. Notice it is using the URL definition and uh, pointing to the file externally. Also pointing to the file externally since this one has an online address that's put in there as well. And so uh, pretty cool. It's just like all the other MF string arrays that we've seen before and we can uh, have our cake and eat it too. Have a local copy file, external copy, or embed it in there. All right, now if you want to use, uh, uh, I'm using X3D Edit right now and we're taking advantage of those features, but you don't have to use that. You can use any text editor. This is just plain old XML when you get right down to it. So uh, if you want to use uh, the text editor that comes with your operating system, be my guest, or uh, an editor that comes with your uh, HTML browser, or an XML editor like XML Spy or Oxygen or some of the other products out there, fine. Have, have a hoot. Uh, if we uh, pop up our interface here, uh, let's, let's look at first the interface for field definitions. Uh, and we can see, okay, there it is, name type, access type, and whether or not there's an initial value. Similarly for our script node, we can look at that and see there's, this is uh, actually more helpful than uh, you might expect. We, it lists each of the URL and uh, with our URL editor uh, we can uh, take a look at those guys. If I stretch it out a little more we can see all the functionality exposed and so this will even uh, let us edit the where the URL is pointing to or let us load the uh, script in our browser. You saw it pop up there in the background or uh, even uh, go to your external browser if that makes sense. So let's edit that again. Open this guy up so we can see everything. Uh, select this. It turned green so since it's not black it's uh, found it. Since it's not red uh, the link was working. Uh, since screen the link is working, red would indicate the link was broken. Um, if we launch it, that should push it into our external browser and sure enough, there it is. So, pretty nice, pretty functional uh, editor here. Alright, so there are different ways to do it. Let's, uh, let's go back to the slides now and look at, uh, look at this guy. Here's our uh, example. It's also prompting you with uh, the appropriate uh, functions for printing, for tracing. I find that pretty helpful sometimes. Uh, so helpful that we give it to you as, uh, as a default in here. Um, okay, and there's the rest of the script there showing you uh, some of the... Uh, at the bottom we had uh, in addition to the uh, initialized script or the customized methods uh, that are defined for each field, we uh, also have some specialty methods, prepare events. and events processed and shutdown. We already learned about the shutdown. That's invoked when uh, the whole X3D viewer, viewer is shutting down. Prepare events and events processed have some other special functionality. Okay, so let's drill down into an example now, a little bit more. And this is called uh, script simple state events.x3d. The functionality of this scene has a push button switch and so we want a button that we can click on, select with a touch sensor, and send routes that will turn a lamp either on or off, toggling its value. We are going to use the script to keep track of the logic, and uh, we'll also use the script to change the color of the light. Uh, sort of cheating, sort of like on, uh, in the movies where 
if you, if you notice whenever a, a movie or a television program is showing a nighttime scene, there's usually actually some ambient light that's provided, maybe uh, an amazingly bright moon shining through the window or, or just, <coughs> just some low level light that's available in there. Okay, so in this uh, particular example, we're gonna put that script code in an external file and uh, thus don't need the extra script. Whether it's internal or external to the document, to the scene, at runtime it does all get loaded. It is in there and the event model that we walk through for input events, for output events, is what governs things. Okay, so here's a picture of that scene, a uh, screen snapshot, and we've drawn out the routes here. So let's take a look at those uh, before we start editing directly. Uh, I've started with uh, two pictures here. First is what does it look like when the light is off and then what does it look like when the light is on, off and on. And each time the user would select the button and notice how it gets recessed here. Uh, the button is uh, not sticking out anymore and uh, indicating that it's animated down and the user has pressed it so it, it looks like a button that you might actually use in the real world and it turns on and off that light. Okay, so how does it work? Well, we start with a touch sensor and uh, that is uh, going to uh, uh, receive the user's input from a mouse or pointing device. And what what do we get from the button touch? Well, we are routing out the touch time event, and we're going to route that to start time of our timer. So where's that timer? Okay, right here, it's a time sensor. Of course, our clock. That's uh, what's getting tickled by it. So what does the clock do? Uh, uh, time sensor. It gets routed right up here to node number three, which is our position interpolator to move the button up or down and so that gets routed to uh, actually looks like I made a mistake on the route here uh, it doesn't get routed up to control box but actually gets routed up to control button interpolator goes to control button which is a different transform the transform right there. Okay, so uh, the other thing that happens to it is it gets routed down uh, to uh, another timer uh, for some further animation. Okay, so let's keep going here. Uh, here's the bottom half of the scene, same scene. Um, when that timer goes active, it goes down to our control script, and our control script then is going to uh, keep track of uh, state, first of all, is the light on or off, and then it's also going to route uh, some values out to, to make it work. Okay, so <clears throat> what is our functionality that we expect to happen in this scene. Well, uh, the control script uh, has a field named uh, button timer active. Okay, button timer active right there. And uh, let's let's do that a different way. Button timer active button timer active. So that function uh, gets the input event and uh, here's the input event coming in right there. And then the next thing is uh, it does some computation and it's passing out two output events. It'll change light color which gets routed right here to change that guy and it's also going to have a new path which will uh, get pushed up in the scene to move the results, okay? Why is that? Because first time when we click on the button, we want our position interpolator to push it down, 
But the next time we click on that button, we want our position interpolator to push it up. So what we're actually doing is modifying not the transform, but the interpolator itself so that we don't jump the button up, jump the button down, but smoothly animate it up, smoothly animate it down by modifying the position interpolator itself. Okay, so pretty cool. Let's, uh, let's keep drilling down here. Um, as we go, we'll look at uh, some of this functionality that we looked at just a second ago and how do our different interfaces uh, keep track of what our fields are, expose that, where our external script is, expose that, what each field definition it can handle, and uh, if it's uninitializable, the fact that it tells you that right here. Okay. So we'll back out of this guy. And by the way, uh, maybe some of you noticed it. Uh, capitalization was mismatched right here on the name of that thing, so I'll fix that. Uh, all of these events in all the routes, the naming is strict, so you can't have upper lowercase differences. They must be exactly correct. All right, so back out to uh, X3D Edit, and here is our scene, simple script state events, and give credit to uh, Len Daly who put this thing together. And then our script node, we'll uh, edit that guy again and sure enough we see that uh, there is no ECMAScript source code embedded internally, so this checkbox is, is left open right here. Uh, the reason why there's no script internally is because we have the script defined externally right here. So usually you have one or the other, not both, internal or external. And uh, that makes it logically much simpler. Okay, we also see that there's a nice uh, uh, ability here to look at all of the uh, uh, fields themselves as well as uh, editing those. So if we click in here we can uh, edit any one of these uh, and select the appropriate type, select the appropriate access type, initialize a value if appropriate. Okay, so pretty cool. We have multiple ways, at least within this tool, of editing our script definition. If we wanted to add a different field, we could do that. Uh, if we wanted to get rid of some, we could. If I highlight one of these, I can get rid of it. If we want to reorder them, then we can use the up or down arrows to move things around. But I'll cancel out. I don't want to break this scene. I want to leave it as is. I wanted to show you that functionality. Similarly, if we highlight one of the fields themselves, we can pull up the editor for that field in isolation. Okay, A moment ago I was showing you the script node editor which lets you look at all of the fields side by side and push them up, push them down, edit them, change them, what have you. Often you don't want all of that stuff at once so we also give you a customized editor for this given field. Uh, uh, this one was interesting and because the access type was input only, can only accept events, we don't see an initialization value in there. That's what we would expect. If we look at the editor, oops, let's get it properly selected here, try editing that guy, we can see, ah yes, it's input only, so therefore no, emissional, no initial value is what the uh, interface tells us. If we compare that to the other field, like this one is an initialize only. So let's edit that. Initialize only, sure enough, it lets us, in fact, asks us to put in that initialization value right there. Okay. What else do we got? Well, let's look at the output only values, the output only fields. 
don't see any initial value like the first one. That's as expected when we go into the interface for this field. Sure enough, we get the reinforcing message from the interface. No initial value. Why? Pick one of the three. Which one is it? That's what it tells you there. Okay, so now we're ready to look at the, uh, uh, the logic of this script itself. So we said input only events go to the corresponding method in the script, the corresponding function that's the black box that takes care of that. Okay, so button timer active is a field in the script and we expect to get a value. Let's recheck where that value comes from. Okay, so button timer active is shown in the slides. We have uh, So button timer active, button timer active, it's getting past an event from where? Well, up here, from the timer. When our timer goes at active, that time sensor, uh, not a field you may use before with time sensor, but it's there. When the time sensor is active, it will send an is active true event. So here's how we know that it's running, and that is what prompts our script to turn on. So we can look inside the script now and say, all right, button timer is active. Here's where that event value comes in. We get the uh, uh, routed event into there. And now here's where we check if the value is true. Okay, now if you're not familiar with that little function, the Exclamation point is really the not operator. So not value would say, if this was false, it's the same as writing if value equals is equivalent to false. That's also what our comment says there. If the value is equal to false, that means our time sensor is no longer active. It says is active false. And that means it's done, because we only get that false upon completion. So, oh, okay, we're all done. So now, uh, this means we're queuing on the timer being complete. At that time, that means we're now ready to check. What was our state? What was our prior state here? Well, button down is whether we uh, is how we're keeping track of state, that the button's already down, would be button down equals true. Button goes up, that would be button down equals false. Okay, so correct naming of your logic helps make it work. Now, if you've never programmed before, <laughs> please bear with us. This is definitely programming. This isn't X3D modeling where we're moving geometry around, but it's saying, we're writing a little chunk of code here with logic that will respond to inputs and outputs. It will be a functional block. Our function here is button timer active. Our black box function has an input of the timer value timer is active is the value coming in. And now we're going to about to look at what are the outputs of this guy. And there are two actually. There are uh, an output of light color and another output of the path. Okay, so let's see what happens logically in the scene. Now that we've traced the logic so far, we see how this script is provoked. It's provoked by a timer completing. Timer completing meaning the animation is done. There's a choice at this point. Is our button down or is our button up? In each case, we want to respond by resetting the light color. And we also want to respond by setting up our interpolator for the next time 
the user comes along and clicks it. Okay, so if our button was down, we would expect this new button path to make it go up, and we would expect this new button path to make it go down. Let's check our logic in the, from the previous scene and see if we're going in the right direction. 